And we welcome you to the November 2020 Denton County Master Gardener Association general meeting and program. We are recording this today and it'll be available for replay on our YouTube channel. And just a reminder that uh, chat is visible to everybody and there's records kept of chat. Um, so just that little disclaimer to let you know, no need to sign into chat unless you are watching with someone else, as we can also pull a handy dandy reference um, to let us know exactly who signed in today. And so we are so pleased to welcome Blake Aldridge from Upper Trinity Regional Water District. He's a great partner of DCMGA, as well as a lot of organizations in our area. Um, we had hoped once upon a time to have this meeting today there at Upper Trinity, um, at the Louisville office and have a wonderful tour of the facility. Obviously, we weren't able to do that with COVID, but Blake, we hope to be able to do that in the near future or the far future or sometime, uh, hopefully sooner than later. Um, but uh, Blake's a great partner with us. Upper Trinity works with our Cool Shade program and uh, he's just partnered with SWAT to create a water education video that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and so we're just pleased to welcome you, Blake. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point and you have the floor. Okay. All right, do you see the full screen? It looks perfect. Okay, great. Um, well, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to um, be with you virtually um, from from my office. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks again for inviting me. Um, definitely enjoy seeing all the all the things that the master gardeners uh, that y'all put out and um, all the work that you've been doing. Um, for residents here in Denton County. So uh, definitely appreciative of, of that. Um, and today I'm gonna to talk about, you know, how protecting water sources begins in your yard, my yard, um, at our homes, businesses, things like that. Um, so I know a lot of this is probably not new to most of you, but um, definitely going to highlight some of the programs we have in place, some of the tools um, that we that we have that you may not know about. So in these programs, what I typically like to do is get some uh, interaction with with folks, um, get some guesses on things, but uh, that would be a little difficult doing this, but um, I asked the question, how much water does it take? So looking at some of our favorite beverages, perhaps, uh, definitely the coffee is, is one of my favorites. Uh, one cup of coffee takes 34 gallons of water to produce, um, or it takes 34 gallons of water to produce one cup of coffee. Uh, that's thinking, you know, the plants in the field all the way through processing um, and then actually making the coffee. A glass of wine, 32 gallons of water. A glass of beer, 19 and a half gallons of water. <clears throat> and then we're thinking about, uh, you know, things we eat or things we wear. A pound of beef is over 1,200 gallons of water. A pair of jeans is over 1,800 gallons of water. And a pair of shoes is over 2,100 gallons of water. Um, and if I had to give to venture, um, I think our phones would require even more water, um, you know, for their production. So uh, this is really just to frame, get us in the frame of mind that it's not just the water we drink or that we use to shower with or cook or, you know, even water, water our yard, um, but it's every, um, you know, a lots of different aspects of our daily lives uh, requires water. So a little bit about the, the water district. Uh, we were created in 1989 uh, by the state legislature 
as a regional or, or wholesale water and wastewater provider. Uh, we currently serve 25 communities in Denton County and uh, the city of Salina in Collin County. And here you can see the outline of our service area. Uh, so we do cover most of most of Denton County. Um, you can see the, the communities that we serve in there as well. So a lot in southern Denton County, but uh, definitely in the northeast portion of the county and, and city of Salina, uh, where we see a lot of growth occurring right now. So we have two water treatment plants. Uh, this is our uh, Taylor treatment plant in Louisville, which is just up the hill from me. Uh, and you see Louisville Lake in the background. This is our biggest, uh, our bigger of the two plants. It could treat up to 70 million gallons of water per day. And, and this is uh, the one in Louisville. Our other one is in Providence Village. Uh, and then we have four water reclamation plants. Uh, this is our Lakeview plant, which is in Lake Dallas. Um, and it can treat up to five and a half million gallons of wastewater per day. Again, that's Louisville Lake in the background. And then looking at our current water sources, uh, obviously the main one we pull from is Louisville Lake. Uh, but we also can get water from Ray Roberts as it flows down the Elm Fork of the Trinity. Uh, and then we have a joint pipeline with the city of Irving to bring water from Chapman Lake, uh, which is in Delta County, you can see on the map, um, bring that over to us. And then you see, um, and, and we actually purchase all that water from the cities of Dallas, Denton, and the city of Commerce uh, is where we get the Chapman Lake water from. Uh, but you see kind of northwest of Chapman Lake, it says Lake Rock Hall. Uh, that is a future lake that's going to go in. Um, we're hoping to start construction uh, sometime in the beginning of, of next year, um, the first part of next year, and hope to start delivering water from that in, by 2025. Uh, and that will provide us another 35 million gallons of water per day on average. Uh, because we are growing a lot, uh, the North Texas region added 1 million people between 2010 and 2020. And it looks like we're going to add another million by 2030. Um, so we see lots of this, lots of homes and apartments going up, lots of roads being widened and new highways, things like that. Um, so really wanted to focus on today. Uh, this is an urban water cycle graphic we developed a few years ago to kind of encapsulate, you know, all the, how water flows through our uh, community, particularly for, for us um, as, you know, the water flows into the lake, we pull it out, treat it, pump it to um, the cities, uh, who pump it to the homes, businesses, schools, the water that is used indoors then goes to a water reclamation plant. And then we treat that water to a high degree, uh, high quality effluent, and we'll actually put it back into the creek or the lake uh, to be reused again. And so uh, not gonna go over all, all this, but wanted to uh, talk about a couple things uh, later in the presentation, I'll talk about uh, our conservation, water conservation programs and tools we have in place to use at, uh, particularly at our homes. But right now I want to talk about um, our watersheds and how we can um, best protect our watersheds. So what is a watershed? It is, as you can see um, in this graphic, it's you know, basically all the land area that drains to a single point. So um, if we think about Louisville Lake, it's all the land area that drains um, either above ground or below ground, because water can move below ground uh, to the lake. And so you see the divides, the higher areas, we know water flows downhill. And so um, from those high points, the water flows down. So in all the 
different things going on in the watershed is going to influence the quality of the water that is in that lake. And for us, uh, looking spe uh, specifically at Lake Louisville, we see it has quite a large watershed. Um, you can see, especially in the northwest part, it, it extends pretty far up into uh, Monte County. And so this watershed actually covers uh, 967 square miles, which is a few square miles larger than all of Denton County. So uh, I believe it uh, contains parts of five counties. So, um, which is really great for, uh, you know, regulation and, and, you know, dealing with different governments. Um, these watersheds do not respect the county lines like they should. Uh, but then looking at uh, these green shaded areas are the 100 year floodplains in Denton County. And so you see we have a lot of creek systems, a lot of um, areas that could be flooded. Um, you know, if we get heavy rains, things like that. We have a lot of water in Denton County. So that's basically what this map is showing. All right, and so we know that our watersheds are influenced by rainfall or the lack of rainfall, which is drought, uh, topography, soil types, vegetation and land uses. And there's really only two things on that list that we have control over, and that's the vegetation and the land uses. Uh, but first, we, we really need to recognize that um, we all live in a watershed. We're always in a watershed. Uh, and so one, one way we like to uh, help get that awareness out is we have a watershed sign campaign, um, like this one you see in the photo. Uh, and you may see these as you drive around. Uh, we have about 250 of these around Denton County at different parts pointing out, uh, you know, they may be crossing a small creek, but that creek may flow all the way to Louisville Lake. And so uh, it's important for us to um, realize, you know, where we are in, in the big picture. And um, like I said, to keep it clean. So why is watershed management really that, that important uh, with such a big water body? Um, well, it uh, protects the quality of our drinking water sources. Uh, yes, we don't drink the water directly from the lake, but if the lake would become more polluted, uh, it may take more effort um, for us to treat that water. So that could mean more chemicals, more energy, uh, or even a, a more advanced uh, treatment system at our treatment plant, uh, all of which costs money, which gets passed on to the residents ultimately. Um, but also protects human health, aquatic life, you know, um, when we hear about these algal blooms or these fish kills that, um, uh, you know, those are things we, we don't want to see. Um, I think in Florida, they're having problems with people getting sick, like respiratory problems from some of the algal blooms. So there really is um, an impact. And then looking at, thinking of all the recreation that goes on Louisville Lake and the other lakes with the boating, the fishing, swimming, um, things like that, and the economic benefits that um, you know visitors bring to those local areas um, could all be affected if uh, the lake were to become um, more and more polluted. And I mean, the stakes are high. Um, I don't, you know, I don't want to share this to scare anyone because we're definitely not close to this point, but this is a headline from uh, Toledo, Ohio, uh, which they get their water from Lake Erie. If you know anything about that lake, pretty nasty. Um, this is back in 2014, uh, where there was a massive algal bloom um, that caused different toxins to get into the water. And basically the city had to completely shut down their water system because their treatment plant could not um, remove those toxins. 
So people could not drink it. They could not um, shower with the water. So and they have about, I think, 200,000 residents that um, for a few days had to find water another way. And so, um, you know, it's something we all take granted, granted of um, or all take for granted, but, um, you know, it's pretty, um, you know, like I said, the stakes are high. Now, coming back to a more peaceful, relaxing photo. This is a, a nice ranch on a spring day in Texas. Uh, thinking about healthy watersheds, they capture rainfall, they filter that water, and that leads to good soil health, abundant vegetation, productive land for agriculture, for um, wildlife, uh, balanced creek systems, uh, and ultimately clean water. Whereas unhealthy watersheds um, lose rainfall, which leads to more erosion, poor soil health, uh, less water in the soil, degraded vegetation, damaged creek systems, and ultimately polluted water. So looking at this uh, comparison uh, on both sides of this fence, um, you know, there's obviously two different management approaches to this. And so the right side is, is a watershed. Uh, it sheds water. And the left side is a water catchment. And that, that's really what we're going for more. Um, you know, we typically say a watershed here in America, but uh, in like Britain, Australia, they use the term water catchment, which is really what we want. Uh, we want to catch that water. We want to store it in our soil. Um, we want that land to be like a sponge. And it comes down to the vegetation management. So how does land use affect water quality? Uh, this probably be a good um, point to mention, as Catherine did, that um, I worked with some of the master uh, gardeners to produce uh, a uh, video on the rainfall simulator demonstration. Um, and they did a great job um, doing that. That's uh, it was kind of, it was a collaborative effort, you know, with the SWAT members not being able to go out to schools um, right now. I'm not able to go out to schools right now. And so, uh, I'm in the process of developing a kind of interactive website to provide more resources for students to learn about watershed and water quality. Uh, and that was one of the resources, new resources developed uh, for that. And so I hope to have that done by the end of the year. But um, I think Tammy was going to share the link to that video. Um, it's about 28 minutes long, but it's really good. Um, so anyway, but back to presentation, um, you know, obviously these different land uses, the ranches, farms, cities, um, our, our own lawns, uh, all these have different ways that they affect water quality, but, um, I'm really going to focus on kind of our urban areas and our, and our yards in particular in this presentation. So, and sorry, this is a, kind of a grainy photo, but um, this is looking at as an area goes from, you know, kind of a natural rural area to an urbanized area, what happens to the water flow? So on the top left, you see what is a natural area. Um, you know, at least half of the water uh, infiltrates into the ground and only 10% runs off. Um, but, you know, all that, um, a lot of that water that infiltrates will actually end up um, making its way to a, the, the nearest creek or, or something like that in the future. And along the way, it's getting uh, pollutants removed by the soil. But as we get more and more urbanized, you see the 
uh, impervious surfaces um, growing in percentage wise, uh, which, you know, those surfaces are the, the rooftops, the, the roads, the parking lots, things like that, that do not allow the infiltration into the soil um, to where once we're, you know, the bottom right, most of that water is running off, very little is infiltrating, and that water that does run off, it's carrying whatever's on the surface with it. So whether that's trash, oil, um, anything, fertilizer, it's going straight into the creek. So it was, you know, a, a real nice um, <clears throat> balanced creek system before. Uh, this is actually Hickory Creek west of Denton at Tom Cole Road. Could lead to, this is not the same creek, this is a different creek, but uh, if we change, start changing the flow patterns, you know, for urbanizing, we're sending a lot more water to a creek. Things like this could happen, a lot more erosion. Um, those creeks, you know, are, they design themselves to match the amount of, of water and sediment flowing down. And when we disrupt that, it could lead to a situation like this. And obviously where we're looking at in this photo is kind of a rural, probably uh, agricultural area. But, uh, you know, one thing that could be happening uh, is an area upstream is urbanizing and sending a lot more water downstream um, to this area causing problems. And if this was in the city, um, you know, too often that would lead to uh, lining it with, with concrete to prevent further erosion. So, you know, seeing this um, major urbanization coming to Denton County, um, you know, particularly in, in areas, you know, west of Flower Mound, um, and the northeast part along 380. Um, the Water District established the Conservation Upper Trinity Conservation Trust in 2010, uh, which is a 501c3 nonprofit land trust. It's a separate organization from the Water District. It's a, it has its own board of trustees, and their main goal is to preserve the Rapkan areas and other key watershed features. Uh, to protect water quality in, uh, in the, mainly the Denton County Lakes, but really the whole Upper Trinity River Basin um, is, is where we want to work. And the main way we do that is through conservation easements. Um, now we have yet to get a conservation easement, but um, if you're not familiar with that, it's basically a voluntary agreement between a uh, land trust and a landowner or a city or a developer to uh, basically voluntarily agree to not uh, do certain things on their property, such as build neighborhoods or uh, subdivide and, and do that. So it protects the um, conservation values of that property um, and we really want to focus on like the floodplain, floodplains or riparian areas uh, and things like that to, to do that. But another big aspect of, of our work is landowner outreach and education. Uh, obviously, conservation easements are not for everyone, but, um, you know, some of these other things like proper cattle management um, and things like that is applicable to a lot of people. And then seeing that even, even more work needed to be done, um, especially for our cities that are urbanizing, we wanted them to um, you know, do the best they could to get out in front of development areas and preserve creeks. Um, the Water District, the Trust, and the Denton County Commissioners uh, all co-sponsored the development of the Denton County Greenbelt Plan. So when I see Greenbelt, I'm basically talking about the vegetated areas along uh, creeks or rivers or lakes that um, 
you know, on, on both sides of the, of the creek bank that are vegetated. So whether that's trees, shrubs, grasses, um, what we don't want to see is development right down to the edge of the creek. Um, and so this was an effort to identify and prioritize uh, these creek corridors, uh, you know, see what, what needed to be preserved uh, to protect water quality in the lakes. And so you can see in this uh, map, the dark green areas, solid green areas are those that are currently protected. Uh, and this is based on, this plan is finalized in 2017. So it's uh, a couple years old, but, um, and it'll continue to be updated. Um, but um, then you see the, the pinkish areas or salmon color, um, not, not too great with all these fancy colors, but um, the pink areas are ones that are in high need of preservation. Uh, they have no protection and, um, you know, protecting them would uh, do a lot for uh, benefiting water quality. And so, um, you know, this is what we're focused on is protecting these, these corridors. The other part of the plan is identifying uh, strategies to implement by the cities, by landowners, by developers to protect these areas. And so it was designed as, a, since it's voluntary program, it's, it's designed that way in order to um, meet the unique circumstances of each community or, you know, the landowner or the developer, you know, for what they want to do. So currently, since that time, we've had 12 entities that have adopted this plan and are looking at uh, ways that they can implement um, some of these strategies. And so uh, you might notice on there that uh, Denton, Louisville, and Flower Mound have adopted that. So the bi three biggest uh, communities in the county have adopted that. And I think that's a great testament to um, you know, the quality of the plan. And um, so, you know, looking forward, we want more communities to sign on. And so um, if you do not see your community on there, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, we could talk about how to get that done. Um, and because we, we really see, you know, the master gardeners, master naturalists and others uh, who live out in these communities to advocate for this plan, um, you know, in mass. And so um, we'd really like to see how we can work in the future together. Another aspect of uh, what the trust does is manage the Watershed Partners Program, uh, which is basically a coalition of cities, individuals, businesses uh, that want to um, help with watershed efforts in the county. Because uh, why, um, you know, why are we so concerned with the riparian or the greenbelt vegetation? Well, we know that, um, you know, the more growth we have above ground, the more we will have um, in root systems. So this is, you know, really used, this photo is really used for looking at uh, overgrazing uh, by cattle, so, but same concept, um, you know, if you have short little turf grasses that you weed eat down to the edge, you're gonna look more like the far right, uh, which what we want is the far left because the top, um, the plant growth above ground is gonna protect that topsoil, but the below ground root growth is what's gonna hold that soil in place. And so that's what we want. And having those good root systems leads to healthy plants, which I'm sure y'all know about. There we go. 
Um, so looking at this creek, uh, this is actually near our office in Louisville. Um, you know, two different management styles. The left side is managed more like a, a park where it's, you know, mowed, weed eated down to the edge. Uh, the left side or the right side was left natural, which there's quite a bit of trash over there, but uh, the trees were left in place. And, um, you know, as obviously the water is flowing against the left side, so that leads to the greater erosion, but having turf grasses uh, with very shallow root systems uh, just leaves the soil vulnerable to that erosion. But I actually went back yesterday um, and for, at least for now, um, the left side has been allowed to, to grow up. And so this is um, really great. And to, and I, and I bring this up as uh, one strategy cities can uh, easily employ is just not mowing so much. Um, this is a, a great example from the city of Austin. Uh, they have what they call grow zones along their creeks. And so this was before they set that system in place. Um, they're doing the regular mow weed eat down to the edge type of program along this creek. And then they stopped um, after, I think they leave 20 to 25 feet of buffer on both sides of the creek. And after a year or two, uh, it looked like this. And then and you can even start to see um, some new willow trees coming in. And then another year or two, we've got more, more trees, great forbs and, and weedy plants growing up that uh, is just gonna, you know, do wonders to hold this um, creek bank stable. Because uh, our green belts are buffers uh, from you know, the, the activities going on around them. So uh, you see this tree um, tree line kind of looks like it's snaking across the landscape. Well, that's uh, Little Elm Creek in Northeast Denton County, uh, north of Savannah, um, that is protected by this uh, forested area and it buffers from the agricultural uh, hay fields around it. But this also works in communities. This is uh, Lantana. Um, there's a creek running running through this wooded area as well. Um, and it provides a great uh, aesthetic benefit for these um, homeowners that back up to this green belt. Uh, but also you see that trail going through the middle of it, a great uh, recreational amenity for this neighborhood. Another way we can protect our creeks is by reducing the amount of storm water that is going to reach the creeks. Uh, and one, one big way we can do that is uh, using more green stormwater infrastructure practices. So that'd be things like rainwater harvesting, uh, rain gardens. This is a biofilter at, uh, in the parking lot of the Doubletree Ranch Park in Highland Village. Uh, so you can see the soil is actually lower than, um, than the parking lot. So as it rains, the water will flow into this area um, and infiltrate down. Instead of going to a gutter and immediately up to a creek, it will go into the soil, filter down. Um, any pollutants would, you know, a lot of pollutants would be removed before it could make its way to um, Louisville Lake, which is just, um, I don't know, a, a thousand feet away. So this is a photo of when this was first put in. And then this was, um, I believe a couple years later. Um, it just has a nice kind of wild look to it, which uh, to me is much more attractive than uh, just turf grass. So what can residents do? Um, you know, particularly for protecting our watersheds and water quality. Well, we can make sure we're 
picking up our trash, um, recycling, properly disposing of household hazardous waste like paints and oils um, and you know, unused fertilizers, uh, even medications. Um, we don't want to flush those down the toilet. Uh, we want to, we just recently had a drug take back day. Uh, that, you know, each police department, I, I believe it's twice a year, um, they'll do a drug take back day. So if you have old medications or medications you don't want um, to use anymore, hold on to those, wait for the next drug take back day or your local police department should have a, like a drop off box. Um, but also, you know, as we walk our pets, you know, picking up their waste uh, that they do in your, in your neighbor's yard. Uh, that way you're protecting the watershed and being a good neighbor. Uh, looking at fertilizers, um, you know, it's, it's important for us to apply them correctly. Uh, we want to follow the instructions on the label and, um, you know, if probably uh, getting a soil test would, would be the best place to start to see if you even need any or what you need uh, before just going and buying a big bag and putting it all out at one time. Um, but we don't want to over apply for sure. Uh, but even using compost or organic fertilizer would be a great second option. And then with grass clippings or right now the leaves are falling. So leaves, we want to keep those, um, you know, on the lawn, uh, it's free nutrients, keep them on the lawn. Um, and, um, or put them in a compost bin or if you need to throw them away. But what we don't wanna see happen is them be blown off into the street and then make their way to uh, the nearest creek, which adds nutrients to a system that does not need it and it just looks nasty. So that kind of wraps up the watershed part of, of the talk. Uh, now I'm gonna talk more about water conservation, uh, especially at, at our homes. And I'm keeping an eye on time, but if I need to speed it up, just let me know. Um, so this is a, a chart showing our um, daily water um, that's from both of our water treatment plants that is treated and pumped out to our cities. Um, so you can see in like the winter months, and this is back from fiscal year 2018. Um, and, and, the, and there's a reason why I use 2018, that I'll talk about in a minute. So looking at December to March, we're kind of hovering, you know, at or below that 20 million gallons per day mark. And then as it starts getting warmer and later into the uh, summer, we see water use going up a lot um, to a point where August 5th, 2018 is the most water we pumped out in a single day, 65 million gallons of water. Uh, that's more than, um, you know, three times what we did in the winter months. Uh, so why is that? Uh, and that's because of this, because we do a lot more outdoor irrigation in the summer. So, and we're, you know, we're definitely not against irrigation. Um, you know, we need it, but we need to be wise and efficient with it. Um, and why does, you know, so what, when we talk about why water conservation matters, it's to, um, especially in the summer months, we want to reduce that seasonal demand uh, because we have to have enough infrastructure in place. We have to have the treat, our treatment plant sized enough and our pipes big enough to where, um, you know, we can meet that summer demand. And so if we have more and more residents coming in and we're all using high amounts of water in the summer, we may have to expand our treatment plant, put in bigger pipes, things like that. But if we can keep our demand down, 
we can get by with what we have, which will increase our community sustainability. Uh, the water we have is the cheapest water we have. Um, you know, same same goes with our infrastructure. Um, you know, the infrastructure we have is um, is what we have, and so it's what we're paying for. And if we can do more with less water, we can boost our economic productivity, and that can include like commercial areas. Um, you know not doing so much outdoor irrigation can put more towards <clears throat> um, improving their products or, um, you know, helping their um, employees out more. So one big thing when we're talking with residents is getting them to understand exactly how much water sprinklers actually use because they don't, usually don't have uh, a good concept of how much water they actually use when they run the sprinkler system. So looking at these different uh, types of sprinkler heads, we see they're all about in the three to five gallon per minute range for each single head. Uh, and if we have, you know, 20 to 30 heads, you know, let's do the math. Or I don't want to do the math, but you can do the math with uh, your sprinkler system. It's a lot. Um, look, so in our, our general outdoor water and recommendations, um, and not just us, but across the, uh, you know, other major water providers in the Dallas Fort Worth area, uh, we recommend no more than twice per week. And that's if needed, if we get rainfall, um, no need. And that's, that is based on, um, scientific data showing, you know, um, if we go more, more than twice per week, we make our plants less resilient in drier times. And so if we only do once or twice a week, we are training our plants to, um, grow the roots deeper to re reach the water that's deeper in the soil. Um, and then not to water between 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, because, um, you know, a lot of water will be lost to evaporation in, in the hot part of the day. But another tool we've had in place for a number of years is uh, watermyyard.org. This is a collaborative effort with um, Texas A&M uh, University, and it's actually a, a statewide program, uh, depending on, so we sponsor weather stations that feed into this. So um, through this program, for those who sign up, uh, they can, you can get free uh, weekly lawn watering recommendations based on the local weather, and that is given in minutes based on the type of sprinkler system uh, that you have. And so in this year, they actually just released an app, uh, which is available for um, Android phones and iPhones. So if you go, probably the easiest thing to do is go to watermyyard.org and they have the direct links to those uh, apps on that website. And so um, that is probably our, our best tool that we have um, for our residents. Um, and here's, and we actually, I didn't um, think to cover it in this um, presentation, but we do have an irrigation checkup program in place where we contract with a licensed irrigator um, to actually go and um, check a, you know, the sprinkler system for a homeowner um, and uh, teach them, you know, how to set the controller, what to look for, um, you know, with the sprinkler heads. And uh, it's probably the, the best benefit from that is the education for the homeowner. And so um, we've had that in place for about three years now. 
uh, well, I think we just wrapped up our fourth year um, and I need to um, go over the results of that program, but preliminarily it looks like uh, everyone was satisfied, major uh, increases in knowledge gained from this, uh, which goes into you know, the photo of these two broken sprinkler heads. Um, you know, our sprinkler systems are like cars. They need to be maintained, uh, taken care of and checked periodically. Um, because, you know, actually the one on the right is my house. This is after we moved in um, probably six years ago or so. And I was doing my own irrigation checkup uh, and I didn't even know there was a sprinkler on this side of the house uh, until I heard this horrible, um, sounded like a waterfall noise on the side of the house. And so um, you can see it's spraying directly onto the house. Um, so I turned that off real quick. So the point of that is we need to maintain our sprinklers. Um, but it's not also not, you know, how, how we water, um, or I guess it's not so much how much water we use, but it's how we water. So on the left side, you can see, you know, especially with our North Texas soils, we, which are heavy clay, we cannot water for that long before they start, um, you know, just shucking the water off and, um, and it runs off, off the surface. And so that could be what's happening on the left side here, um, or it could be, you know, wind drift as well, but it doesn't matter. There's a lot of water running off into the parking lot, uh, but looking on the right side, um, you know, that, that is part of the problem is watering for too long at one time. So a lot of that water is flowing off, creating a nice river down the street uh, but you can also see there by that sewer lid, uh, there's a little, um, you know, uh, looks like a little spring of water. That's a, a sprinkler head that needs to be fixed. So a few issues on this property. So that's when we promote the cycle and soak uh, watering method. And so uh, what this is, is basically, you know, doing shorter cycle watering cycles. So, you know, four to six minutes uh, and then waiting 30 to 60 minutes to allow that uh, water to soak in uh, before running another cycle. Um, and that can continue or if you need to do cycles on other days, um, you know, to get the water you need, then you can do that. Um, looking at, you know, protecting our foundations and our young trees. Um, we don't need to run the full sprinkler system just to benefit our foundations when we could use uh, a soaker hose and be more precise with that water. Uh, rain free sensors are, are something that we promote. Obviously the greatest, the best rain free sensor uh, is the homeowner. If, you know, if it has rained or if you know there's a good chance of rain coming up. It's best to just turn that sprinkler system off, see what you get or how much you get. And then, um, but, you know, this is Texas and we have um, crazy weather. And so, you know, we'll um, get these thunderstorms in the middle of the night um, and, and other times. And these rain, sen rain free sensors will help um, you know, if you've gotten rain or you're getting rain, it'll shut the sprinkler system off automatically um, and help you save water that way because you don't want to be that guy or girl. Um, to know, you know, to get to work and realize that your sprinklers ran because it's Tuesday and you had a big two inch rain last night. Uh, and all that water that you didn't need to use. But there's also some, uh, you know, different 
water um, efficient things we can do um, to improve our sprinklers. So uh, we could switch to these multi-stream nozzles. Uh, you can see there's multiple streams coming out. And what that does is it puts out bigger water droplets, which are um, less prone to evaporation. So they're much more efficient. Um, a lot more water actually gets on the ground than with the conventional spray heads that have that um, single sheet of water that goes out. But there's also like smart controllers, uh, pressure regulating sprinkler bodies, uh, and things like that. Uh, one thing we just did this year, um, which you can see the, the Water University logo on that, we partnered with the Water U University folks, uh, which uh, if, if you didn't know, they've been um, dissolved and those guys are now a new, formed their own company called Rooted In. Uh, but um, this summer we developed a publication with them um, that kind of covers a lot of these things, basically from, um, you know, what you need to know for selecting plants all the way through maintaining your irrigation system uh, and con basics of the sprinkler controller. So um, you can see that link at the bottom um, the B, bit.ly, um, uh, bit.ly slash utrwd brochure. Uh, if you go to that, you can download, um, that brochure for free, uh, from that link. And so obviously caring for our water sources. So protecting water quality, conserving our water resources, uh, it takes all of us. Uh, and so there's, I encourage everyone to go visit our website, uh, which is right there, utrwd.com. Um, we actually, it's a new website. We have some new features on there, uh, direct links to Water My Yard, um, a feature that um, updates lake levels uh, every day, um, if you want to learn more about our water treatment or wastewater treatment processes, we have interactive graphics on that. And, um, and then our water conservation watershed protection pages. Um, but we're also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and uh, YouTube. So um, please go and, and follow us, like us, subscribe, whatever you want to do. And uh, there's my email address. Feel free to uh, contact me anytime. And um, I guess with that, I don't know what, what y'all's timing is, but uh, I can take some questions. Thank you so much, Blake. We do have time for questions and we do have some questions and some comments in the chat. So I'll pull them up for you and while I do, I did want to thank you again, and we really appreciate your partnership, as I mentioned earlier, as well as everything you do to educate our community about um, our, our water system and our watersheds and, and how we can conserve water. You do a great job. Feels like I see you everywhere, which is awesome. <laughs> well, thank you. So the first question we have, um, Blake from Sharon. What is the contact address for obtaining a watershed property sign and would it include a pole? Um, so if, if that would be for, so we, we wouldn't provide it to homeowners, uh, but we would provide it to um, the city or a utility, um, but you can, um, shoot me an email. Um, you can see my email right there, baldridge at utrwd.com. Um, and we can, you know, talk about that more. Super. I know the person that's asking has, um, has a large property with some acreage and she has a lot of um, wonderful wildlife management practices in place already too. So Sharon, if you heard that, if you can just give 
Blake an email. Uh, send Blake an email, and he'll help you out as much as he can. Yeah, yeah we I, would... I heard. I, I I heard it. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Thanks for the question. Yeah, and if you if you um, have a large property and or along a roadway, um, you know, just yeah, send me an email. Let me know that information, and we'll definitely consider that. Um, just to, to this point, we've only, you know, provided that to um, cities, our customer cities and utilities. And uh, Blake Lee is asking if a river runs through your property that you own, would you advise using it to irrigate? Um, well, the problem with that is, uh, I don't know if you would need a permit. It and you know it depends on what you're irrigating. Um, if you know if it's a full scale farm uh, operation, um, I would say probably not, because the water is owned by the state of Texas. Um, so the you may own the land. But the water and the creek bottom, well, maybe not the creek bottom, but at least the water is owned by the state. Uh -huh. So I would recommend um, maybe calling the county public works um, folks to find out, you know, if there's permits you need or something like that. Um, you know, because if they, find out you've been using water when you shouldn't have uh that I, I don't want to uh you know speculate on on any fines that might come from that sure. so well, i would just do do your best due diligence to find out if you need a permit or permission something like that good information and good advice uh, Michelle's got a comment. The new Thrive Recreation Center in Louisville has implemented a lot of the green stormwater infrastructure practices, and they're all using native plants there. Very cool. And then Lee's also um, letting everyone know in Flower Mound, you can take any drugs as in your prescriptions to the police station anytime during business hours to avoid um, flushing them or disposing of them in an improper way. Um, and a lot of other towns probably have that practice as well. And then a question from Pam, I'm sorry, were you gonna say something there? Oh, I, was, um, I don't remember if I said it in the presentation. Yeah, that's um, really good because um, folks may think, oh, well, we'll flush it in the wastewater plant, we'll take care of it. Uh, they usually don't um, because those chemicals are not, we, we don't have the um, uh, technology or the, we're basically not set up to handle the amount of medications we get. And since um, we already have to deal with so much that, you know, as it goes through our body and, and comes out, um, we have to deal with that. Plus, if we're just dumping more medications down the toilet, um, you know, that could lead to, as we put that water back into the lake, could affect, you know, the fish um, and eventually human populations. So, yeah, let's do our part to keep um, things like that out of the water system. Excellent. And then uh, along those lines, I suppose, Pam is asking, why hasn't Denton County implemented a source to recycle paints, oils, pesticides, et cetera? Um, we do have a drop off for, for those, correct? Or pick up? So it, oh, she said Denton County. Um, so we actually have a household hazardous waste trailer that we use uh, to pick up items at, in certain communities. Um, and we actually work with Denton County at times, um, you know, in certain areas like uh, Lantana, Oak Point, 
to to do these um, mobile collection events. They usually coincide with like uh, with other things the community might be doing, um, and then we'll we'll take that to um, the environmental what's it called environmental collection center in Fort Worth, um, where they can process those items. Um, and I believe if you reach out to Denton County Public Works, you can get a voucher um, to, uh, you know, if you want to take all that stuff down to Fort Worth yourself, um, you can, or just wait till the next uh, pickup event. Or, you know, when, when people call and say, I have some uh, motor oil and things like that, well, you can just go drop off oil at like a mechanic shop or some uh, auto shop type place uh, and they'll, they'll process it. So um, yeah, but definitely feel free to reach out to me um, through email with more um, if you have more questions about that. Thank you. And we have a question from Sharon again um, regarding broad spreading of fire ant suppressant bait. Does that have an adverse effect on water quality? Um, if you're doing little spot treatments, um, probably not. Um, but if you're just dumping it all over your yard and then we get a big rainstorm come in and you know potentially a lot of it gets washed off then then yeah uh well you know it'll impact it you know for a certain area um it may be it may get diluted enough but the the, the problem is if everybody on your street does that um you know i said it takes all of us and so yeah, one or one or two folks doing doing something may not have a big, um, may not cause a big problem. But if so many people are doing it, which um, you know these fertilizer companies, um, you know they're uh, they're not hurting financially. Uh, that's because people people buy them because they've bought into um, the marketing that. You know, we need to fertilize three times a year uh, in the spring and summer and then twice in the fall, you know, so things like that, that um, we really need to uh, be on guard against. Sure. And Pam is asking, um, in Denton, there's a creek that runs through the southeast corner of the intersection of the Loop and 380 University. Um, she said that was clear cut and then the bulldozers ran for days about three years ago and development was scheduled but fell through. Since that time, the land was left vacant and is Upper Trinity working with Denton City County on this problem area? Uh, is it, you said in the city of Denton? Yes, Pam, you said it's at the intersection of the Loop and 380 University. Yes, it is. Yes. Um, if it's in the if it's in the city limits, then the city would have the control over that. And um, um, I mean, the city of Denton does a lot as far as watershed protection. They actually have a watershed protection department. And so, um, but um, yeah, I I would have to to look at it, and um, yeah, we're we're not aware of it. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, and then someone's asking Blake, with all the new home developments going up, are the builders required to work with the water district? to determine the impact on water demand and sewage? Um, so if it's like one of these master plan communities like um, Lantana was or 
you know, up in the northeast part along 380, um, Savannah, Artesia, um, Paloma Creek, some of these that aren't part of like a, like a city. Uh, whereas like in Flyer Mound, if, um, you know, development comes in, they would just work with the Flyer Mound utilities. Uh, so yes, they, they would have to um, figure out, you know, how much water they're going to need. And, um, you know, and we, we work on that constantly. So they, um, and it's kind of a complicated um, system, how we do our, you know, how much water each community is allowed to have. It's based on like subscription. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of a compliment complicated thing. Um, it's definitely not, if you've heard of the North Texas municipal, uh, system, which they actually just changed, but it was called, uh, take or pay, uh, to where you had like, you know, a set amount of water and you have to pay for that. No matter if you only use, you know, even if you use less than that. So our system is more set up like that uh, to where you play, pay a flat fee. And then um, depending on how much you use, then, um, then you'd pay, you know, that extra. So it does encourage conservation. Um, but obviously we have infrastructure we have to pay for. So, you know, the more and more you use, the more that flat fee grows as well. So, um, that's kind of a quick and dirty way to explain it. Um, but basically it does encourage conservation. Um, and so, yes, we do work with the developers. They have to, you know, tell us how much water they're going to use. Um, and then we'll go from there. Awesome. We'll do a couple more Blake, um, inspired a lot of comments and questions. <laughs> Uh, Sheila says that she had the irrigation assessment last year at her home and highly recommends it. And she was given very specific help for her specific controller and water pressure and heads and rotors. And she just said it's very helpful. Um, and the suggestions were great for drip system conversions. And then after that, Becky asked, how do folks sign up for the irrigation assessment? Um, so we have... Um a link to an online request form, uh, which I can send. So our, our program, I'll just tell you, our program is um, closed down for the year because uh, we can, we've only budget between three and 400 a year. Um, and so what we try to do is target certain uh, communities to be able to spread out um, those checkups and um, what obviously if, and that's available to our um, residents that live in our water customer cities. And so like someone in uh, city of Denton would not be able to get one. Um, so that, and, and that's kind of how we figure all that out in the online request form, but um, We've already used our budget amount for this year. And so we'll, you know, be looking at reopening that in the spring, probably early spring, late winter. Um, and so I can uh, um, go ahead and shoot me an email and um, I can send you the link and it'll just be sitting there in the, you can sit there on the wait list. Um, and then what I do is I send that wait list to the irrigator who schedules those uh, checkups. Great, thank you so much. We'll take uh, two more questions. And then there's also for you guys listening in a lot of good responses about um, using water from the creeks on your property. Check, check and see if you have riparian water rights maybe in your home deed and other information about um, recycling and um, things like that in your area. But Lee is asking, Blake, if your slides would be available after today. I know we'll be 
um, having the whole presentation available for replay on our YouTube channel. Um, but would folks have access to review your slides again? Sure, I can. Yeah, I can provide a. I can provide them in PDF. Um, some of the slides that I had animations on um, probably won't show up. Um, but yeah, I can provide that um, okay. to y'all. Thank you so much. Um, and then the last one from Phyllis. Phyllis says this time of year, she sees the leaves blown into the street by the lawn services and she knows that's not a good idea and wonders if you think about conveying this as a public service message to our communities. You have, you filmed something like that, haven't you? Or you've addressed it. Yeah, so we, we post about it on, on our social media. Um, and I've actually seen the town of Flyer Mound um, do that as well. Um, but, you know, especially with those um, lawn companies, uh, they don't, they, you know, they don't want to take the time to uh, and have to carry around a bunch of bags of leaves um, with them. So it's, um, you know, it's one of those things that we just have to educate and kind of rely on people to do uh, what's best. But um, it's a process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Blake, thank you so much. A lot of great comments and folks thanking you for your presentation today. And um, we're going to morph into our business meeting. You're welcome to stay for that. But we certainly understand if you want to bug off and, and get to work right there. Yeah, I actually have to jump on to another meeting. So. All right. Well, thanks again for being with us today. You're welcome. See you again soon. All right. Thank you all. Okay. Thanks, Blake.